we are reaching this point, especially today, because with all of this surge of artificial intelligence and technology, uh, it's it's the perfect moment for this truly humanistic um, essence of loving what you do, of doing what you do with passion, of, of really devoting yourself to doing it in, in an extraordinary way, that it's it's the only way we're going to compensate this, this, this revolution that technology is bringing to us right now. Welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast from Premier Speakers Bureau, featuring in-depth conversations with the world's most in-demand keynote speakers. Hi, I'm Brian Lord, president of Premier Speakers Bureau, and our guest today is Felipe Gomez. He has given over a thousand performances in 65 cities, 25 countries, over 15 impactful years. He's an artist, humanitarian, thought leader, and keynote speaker. Uh, he combines his unapologetically bold approach to leadership with an unforgettable keynote format. And uh, and he even has a grand piano at center stage. So Felipe, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of the Beyond Speaking podcast. Thank you, Brian, a true honor to be here and uh, wonderful to spend this time with you. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks. We're, we're, we're happy to have you. Uh, and so um, how did your, so you're this musician, uh, world, world renowned. How did you get into music initially? Well, actually at, at very young age, because my father plays the piano. So there was always music at home. Uh, my, my parents tell me that my lullabies when I was a baby was my father playing the piano. So since I, since I was very young, I was exposed to music and I very, easily fell in love with the piano. And uh, at a very young age, uh, around four, um, my father started teaching me the first songs and I got into a, uh, lessons with a, with, with a friend uh, of my parents. And I started, since I was very young, studying music, uh, mainly throughout all of my school, primary, mm -hmm. middle school and high school years. And it was a beautiful journey just to fall in love with music and finding that that it was something that probably I was I was destined to <laughs> pursue in a more serious way. Yeah. And so what was your first instrument or was it just everything or is it always piano or what? what's kind of your your. Um, yeah, my first personal? instrument was piano. And um, I know they say that if you play the piano, it's easier for you to learn other instruments. So I learned a little bit of guitar, not 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 very much, but just the basic chords and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And then uh, later in life, like when I was in probably ninth grade, I, I got a flute as a, as a Christmas present and I, I, I played the flute for many years. Um, I also play a little bit of bass, uh, mainly jazz bass, uh, nice. which I really enjoy a lot, but mainly piano. Mainly piano is my, my instrument. Okay, very cool. And then what made you feel like you could play all over the world? I know you've lived everywhere it seems like uh what what made you realize that you could you were sort of a worldwide talent thank you yeah interesting because when i graduated from high school you know i had this very difficult decision to make if i really wanted to go and study music you know it was one of my my paths but my father who also influenced me in music he's a he's an engineer and had a corporate career and i really felt attracted to that business world too mm -hmm. so at the end uh, I decided to go and study business administration. Uh, I went for an undergraduate degree in business and then did a master's in business administration in, in Switzerland. So music was always my hobby. You know, I, I really never pursued music as a profession. Uh, it was all, all, always my my hobby, my, my way of uh, spending free time, of enjoying, of uh, getting my stress level down. Whenever I was kind of stressed, I went to the piano. So it was really funny. Because, because all of my career and my education has been in business, mm -hmm. uh, starting and managing businesses of all sizes, from startups to huge multinational corporations. But my hobby has always been music. And, and, mm -hmm. and if you see today, what I do is through music, I teach music leaders mm -hmm. uh, how to become better leaders, how to excel in what they do, how to get to true levels of extraordinary performance. So it was a beautiful journey of how my two passions, you know, coincided later in life and and I've been doing this for 15 years and it's it's been a true gift. Great, great. So how would you define uh given your background how would you just define an extraordinary performance? Yeah, well basically when I start my my keynotes I start with a with a clip of an audience in a concert doing a standing ovation, you know, and and basically I ask the audience what do you think happened there? What is it that these musicians have that were able to 
provoke this spontaneous reaction from the audience, you know? 2,000 people, you know, enthusiastically clapping and shouting. What happened there? And if you start decomposing what happened there, it's basically a, a, a true framework for extraordinary performance that provokes standing ovations that can be perfectly translated to the business world. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so what I do through the keynote is trying to decompose what these great virtuoso musicians have mm -hmm. and what they can teach us as business leaders to become also virtuosos in what we do, becoming virtuoso leaders and helping us and our teams achieve true levels of extraordinary performance. Mm, I love it. So how as a leader, how do you adapt those sorts of things to, to bring your team up to that level? Sure. So basically what I say is that there are three elements that these great musicians have to provoke that standing ovation from their audience. And those are method, attitude, and passion. Uh, so if, if you see it from a music perspective, of course, a musician has to follow a method with discipline and rigor so that they can play their instruments with mastery. You know, it's really true technical mastery to play their instruments in an extraordinary way. That's the first condition. The second condition is that through their attitudes on the stage, they're able to create these connections with their audiences, you know. And the third one is that when they play their music, not only with technical proficiency and mastery, but also with passion and love is mm -hmm. when they create this, this true bond with their audience. So when you put together these three um, pillars, method, attitude, and passion from a music perspective, it's when a musician is able to get a standing ovation from their audience. And now you think it from, from, a, from a business or a leadership uh, point of view, it's exactly the same. You know, a leader has to have a method Discipline, rigor has to be an authority, someone that people look up to, that it's really knowledgeable and really good at what he or she does. Number two, they have to have the people skills and the right attitude so that they connect, they can connect with the people around them. And if they do what they do with passion and love, it's what truly inspires and evokes people to follow them. So it's perfectly transferable. You know what a musician has on stage? It's exactly the same set of skills that a leader has to have. Um, to become a virtuoso leader. And then this goes down throughout all the organization. If everybody embraces a virtuoso mindset and does what they have to do and do what they have to do with method, attitude, and passion, they will become virtuosos and reach these extraordinary levels that will provoke standing ovations from their clients, their peers, their bosses, everything, everyone. Everyone is going to be celebrating and giving signs of appreciation to the people that behave and act as virtuosos. So you've been doing this for a really long time. Out of those three things, method, attitude, passion, where do you feel like most companies need to, to add that in that, that, that's most lacking? That's a great question, Brian. And it's definitely passion. And, and I always, I'm, I'm very explicit uh, in my keynote because basically what I say is that every single company in the world, every single leader in the world is talking about and it's devoting time and resources and budget and everything to method to trying to reach better levels of operational excellence. You know, people are trying to incorporate new technologies to see how they can use artificial intelligence in their businesses, how to create more efficient processes, how to adapt methodologies like agile or lean methodologies so that they become truly extraordinary from a technical perspective and reach operational excellence. Every company is, is, is thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Most companies in the world are thinking about building a, a good culture, you know, embracing the right attitudes, the right values inside the corporation DNA so that people behave and act in a certain way that are going to allow them to better connect with their stakeholders. But very few companies in the world, truly, truly very few companies in the world are investing the same time and resources and energy into seeing how love and passion can add into the equation, you know? And I think if this is what really makes a true difference. If you see those brands that are followed by their fans, like true fans, like a almost like a religion, it's because they are putting a lot of passion in what they do from product design, process design, everything they do, they do it with, with a true, you know, passion of trying to please the customer in the most amazing way and to provide them with the most amazing experience. And when you put passion and love in that equation, it makes all the difference. Basically, what I say is that when you do what you do with love, the ordinary ceases to happen and the extraordinary starts to happen. 
And, and I show this through music uh, during my, my performance where I play uh, the piano with passion and without passion. And you can perfectly notice the difference. And the same happens when you are talking to a, to a customer or designing a product or anything in the business world. When was there like a certain moment when you were like, aha, passion, whether it was music or in the business realm, was there this moment where you're like, that's it, that's what's missing? Yeah, well, basically, as I told you, most of my experience has been on the on the business side, right. but I always, always because of music, being a, a very, how would you say, um, my sensibility is is kind of uh, on, on on high levels compared to other people, you know. Right. So so I I was able to realize and to and to feel and to and to learn that when leaders really you know are, are are vulnerable and and expose themselves and do what they do with love you know and and do it with true passion is when people really follow when people really connect when people really wants to 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 go the extra mile you know when because because they see on their leader someone that is that is doing that by example leading by example so i always thought that passion and love was important and and it's this is really interesting because when I started doing this this conference, nobody spoke about love. You know, probably um, Tim Sanders with "Love Is the Killer" app. You know, was one of the very first uh, minds that brought love into the equation. Um, I remember when I read his book many 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 years ago, probably in two thousand three or two thousand four. I was really impacted because I found uh, not only a, a huge coincidence on 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 the importance that we both gave to love but there were many coincidences that Tim and I had in the way our careers developed and who influenced us and, and all of that stuff and I, I actually connected with Tim and we had a, a great conversation at the time uh, but it, it was very few people that really talked and cared about passion and love mm. if you see today you know probably 20 years later um, this has gone much more mainstream you know i was in, in in vienna a couple of years ago in in a very important conference that is held every year in vienna called the global peter drucker forum and it's basically a forum where a lot of business leaders and academic leaders uh get together to honor the ideas of peter drucker uh, and i went there to deliver virtuoso but something that really struck me is that in every single panel in every single presentation both love and passion were present you know and, and for me that was like like wow it's really nice that all of these CEOs and all of these deans of the most important business schools in the world are truly realizing the power of love and passion in work, you know? And, and I think we are we are reaching this point, especially today, because with all of this search of artificial intelligence and technology, uh, it's, it's the perfect moment for this truly humanistic um, essence of loving what you do, of doing what you do with passion, of, of really devoting yourself to doing it in, in an extraordinary way, that it's it's the only way we're going to compensate this, this, this revolution that technology is bringing to us right now. You know? mm -hmm. So I think it's super relevant today. Yeah, no, definitely. So let's say you're a leader or you could be anybody in the company. You hear your presentation. How do you go from being somebody who's operated pretty mechanically to being somebody who's able to express that business, coworkers, wherever it may be, what's kind of their first steps to, to yeah. be able to implement this? Well, it's, it's, it's really nice because the, the, the name virtuoso obviously comes from the parallelism of, 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 of a virtuoso musician, someone that is really good at, at their instrument. But at the same time, if you analyze the root of that word virtuoso, it's virtue, you know? And, and basically what I do is that in each of these three pillars, method, attitude, and passion, I decompose it into three virtues that leaders can develop to grow in virtue and become better in method, attitude, and passion. So for example, in method, the three virtues are magnanimity, discipline, and perseverance. Mm -hmm. So magnanimity is a virtue of thinking big, of, of having this ambitious mind, and it's also oriented to the good of the other people and of yourself. That's magnanimity. Discipline is doing what you have to do on time, you know, and, and doing and following through and being rigorous with what you have to do. And perseverance, of course, is not, not uh, surrendering when you face difficulties or challenges, but just going on, developing resilience, all of this stuff. So when leaders develop these three virtues and there are specific 
micro skills that you can develop to strengthen and, and to grow in these virtues, you are growing on method and you are becoming a better leader to bring your team to give, uh, to perform better and to reach better levels of operational excellence. Mm -hmm. In attitude, the three virtues are empathy, service, and humility. So if you grow in empathy, put, being being able to put yourself on, on the shoes of the other person, trying to feel how they feel, to think how they feel, if on top of that you have a an attitude of serving, of, of having this, this attitude of helping other people to, to grow, to better, to, to become better, you know, and then uh, humility, if you do it with humility, not, not with, with arrogance, but with humility, that's the perfect equation so that your attitudes allow you to better connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And on passion, the three virtues are love, courage, and prudence. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's a very simple but applicable framework that leaders can follow, you know, and 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 grow in these nine virtues that are going to allow them to become virtuosos in what they do and become better leaders. So the one surprise me out of those was prudence. So where does okay. where does that fall into everything? Okay, super. It's very important. You know, the, all of this stuff is based on on very very old. Um, Theory from Aristoteles and and uh, Aristotelic and Thomastic philosophies, okay, and Aristoteles called prudence the mother of all virtues. It's the most important virtue of all, because of two reasons. Number one, it's that inner voice that we all have inside that guide us on doing the right thing, okay, and and many of us don't hear that voice any longer, you know, and that's when we mess up and we start acting in unethical ways. So mm -hmm. prudence is the virtue that, that is going to allow you to really act in an ethical way, in a principled way that what you do is right. But most importantly, and this is really interesting, and this is all Aristotelian uh, theory, each virtue has two vices. You know, if, if a virtue is a habit of good action, a vice is a habit of bad action. Okay, so for example, if you if you say, uh, let's say, uh, discipline. Okay, the lack of discipline is laziness, and and that is a, a vice, the vice of laziness that makes you a lazy person, a lazy leader. Okay, but there's another vice for 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 discipline, which is the excess of discipline. Okay, too much of a virtue is also bad. And many leaders fall on, on that side of the scale, you know? Mm -hmm. So too much of discipline makes you a rigid leader. It's rigidity, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and with all of the nine virtues, I can show you which, which is the vice of defect of the virtue, of the virtue and the vice of excess of the virtue. Mm -hmm. So prudence is that virtue that allows you to find that balance, okay? And Aristotle calls it the golden mean. And it's that golden mean that you have to reach as a leader to truly be a virtuoso leader without going to any of the both opposite sides of the of the scale, but being there in 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 balance in in that golden mean, being a true virtuoso. Oh, that's great. So I'm um, so I'm curious to know. So I I in Music City, I'm surrounded by musicians. I, my whole family. Um, let's say you have a non musician in the audience or or a group of. How do those people normally react to your presentations? No, they love it because at the end, Brian, you know, and, and, and being in Nashville, you, you, I'm sure you understand this. Music is a universal language. You know, people don't have to play any instrument. People don't have to understand or or know how to read or to sing. You no, know, as a matter of fact, every time I deliver my keynote, all the audience sings with me. OK, so e either it's a it's a small group of 20 people, which I love these small groups with intimate, you know, very small groups or or a huge arena with four or 5,000 people, I always sing with them, okay? I'm not a good singer. I don't mind. I play the piano. I sing along. And at the beginning, people are a little shy, you know, and and, and they they feel a little uncomfortable singing. But at the end, when I walk them through applying these nine virtues to the process of singing, they end up singing incredibly well, you know, on tune, in synchrony, with energy, with the right attitude. And it's really powerful to see the transformation of an audience that in less than an hour starts singing, you know, without any kind of interest, even a little bit, you know, angry with the idea of singing in public with people that they don't feel comfortable with. At the end, they are hugging together and singing. And there's it, it's really beautiful because there's, there's science behind it that when people sing together, it creates a sense of unity, a sense of 
of of belonging you know so so whenever i do my keynote people go out feeling part of something bigger of something more more than than what they used to think with where they were no and 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 it creates a beautiful anchor because i received videos years after i i did the the, the keynote felipe were thinking about you and they're hugging there singing the song you know so it's really nice and and music makes it so powerful and i, I always tell my clients it's it's a very beautiful combination because when you deliver good applicable ideas but at the same time, you are touching people's hearts. You know, it's it's where magic happens. It's 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 when truly is a, a, a performance that people remember, that people apply, that people love, and people always relate back to 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 these kind of experiences where you stimulate their minds, but at the same time, you're able to touch their hearts. You know, given your background, so you're originally from Colombia. You've lived right. all over the world. Uh, you live in Atlanta now. How has that uh, allowed you to to bring sort of a, your own unique message to audiences? Yeah, well, beautiful, because because the um, the universality of music makes this a truly universal language. Many people told me, and I, and I shared this uh, with Josh the other day that we were talking. T uh, told me uh, I was hired to do a, a presentation in Norway for 4,000 people in a huge event in Norway. Wow. And they they told me, Felipe, don't do the singing part in Norway because you know these Nordic people, they're not going to sing, they're, they're not going to follow. And I really thought about it, you know, but when I was there on the stage in front of that huge crowd, I said, what the hell? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do <laughs> I'm it. Gonna do it. Yeah, and at the beginning it was very uncomfortable because they truly felt uncomfortable and and and, and not not all of them played along with the with the best attitude. But at the end of the keynote, everybody was absolutely engaged. And the same happened in Asia, and the same happened in Latin America, and the same happened in the US, regardless of which state I'm I'm doing it. Music is universal. People really connect with themselves and with others through music. When when you're in a party in a concert, it's music is an enabler for 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 facilitating relationships for for having fun, for enjoying, you know? So, so at the end, this is an experience that teaches you a lot of stuff. You learn, you feel, you know, you connect with other people and it's, it's music makes it truly universal. I, I, I found this and, and today it doesn't matter where I go. I always do it. People warn me, you know, in Japan, they're not going to be, they will, they, they will because music always connects people. So I'm uh, just to close with this. I know you've uh, you sent this story over to me. I love to hear about your time in college. Were you able to get into uh, an incredible, a would be incredibly expensive concert? Uh, that's a great story. Well, when I was in 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 college in my undergraduate degree in Colombia, I did a semester abroad. I know it was actually an internship, an internship abroad in London in the UK, and I, that was a, a, a truly um life-changing trip for me it's it's where i truly fell in love with classical music uh i went to concerts at least to three or four concerts a week uh these were all free concerts mainly in churches uh you know organ concerts and string quartets and little ensembles and little orchestras and 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 it was it was amazing it, it, in that trip i also fell in love with art Mm. Uh, the National Gallery in London in Trafalgar Square was one of my favorite venues to visit. And I went there and visit, you know, and studied a lot of art. It was also the place where I fell in love with wine. Uh, I, I I love wine. So it, it was uh, in that trip. It was it, it was a truly life changing thing. But one day I was uh, browsing through Time Out magazine, which is the guy I used to 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 consult to, to see what who was performing. I saw that there was this concert of the music of Andrew Lloyd Webber, the the, the famous uh, musical composer, uh, in Saint Paul's Cathedral, and um, I said, "Well, I, I guess probably it's a free concert. Uh, it's also in a church like the ones I, I used to go." So I went there after after work, and I was uh, doing line, and. At the end, it wasn't free. It was a very expensive concert because it was a, a fundraiser to 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 rest restore the you know the the dome of the cathedral, mm. uh, and the cheapest ticket was like three hundred um, pounds sterling, which was for me as a student a lot of money. So I just very disappointedly turned around and said, "Well, I cannot afford it." But then when I was going down the stairs, I thought to myself, 
when in your life you're going to be in this wonderful place listening to Andrew Lloyd Webber with the with the London Philharmonic I mean just go go ahead and do it you know and I turned around and I went there and the lady told me oh, oh you came back I said yes yes I want to come in and she says what do you think about paying 20 pounds <laughs> and I said wow so I took my wallet paid the 20 pounds and, and she said uh, to the usher please uh, take this gentleman to his seat and and we started walking through the central aisle of the cathedral and suddenly he took a little chain off and he said this way and I, and suddenly i saw this dome and i was there completely distracted looking at this beautiful uh structure and, so, and suddenly the the guy says this is your seat and, and suddenly i realized i'm sitting on the second row of the cathedral right there by the aisle and i said oh my god this is just this is a gift you know <laughs> and, and the first row was empty <laughs> So I thought to myself, well, you know, if, if no one comes, I'm, I'm just going to hop and 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 switch to to the first <laughs> row. And then the orchestra director came. Nobody sat in the in the in the first row, so I was about to move to the first row. And they start playing the British national anthem. And I I I, I stare to my side, and everybody starts looking to the back of the church. And and I turn around, and and Queen Elizabeth is coming in <laughs> through the central aisle with this, you know, huge group of people all super elegant you know and the queen sits right there in front of me so she was sitting in, in, in the first row right there in front of me you know I, I was so tempted just to say hey how are you <laughs> <laughs> so it was a beautiful story because I, I was able to share um, with the queen uh, this wonderful concert which was absolutely memorable and well you know it's 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 something that I, I will never forget <laughs> that is great that is awesome well thank you for sharing that and Felipe, thank you so much for being a guest here on the Beyond Speaking podcast. For anybody who's watching or listening, uh, you can make sure to go to premierspeakers.com and uh, check out uh, Felipe Gomez, and you'll be able to see all of his information in there. So Felipe, once again, thank you so much for joining us and being part of the podcast. No, Brian, thank you and really looking forward for a great 2024 together. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking podcast. To learn more about today's guests, visit premierspeakers.com. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen.